Hello everyone and welcome to today's ARI seminar. Can I just check that people online can hear me okay? Please post a thumbs up or something like that to let us know that the sound fresh is working okay online. Because this is an unusual day and it's a really exciting day. This is the first time that we've had an in-person seminar at ARI since 2019. So, hooray to all of that. <laughs> it's really wonderful and it's so fantastic to see so many people here in the room and online and a lot of faces that I haven't seen in ages. It's lovely, lovely to see you all. So, thank you all for coming along. This is a really wonderful occasion to bring us back to ARI seminars. Before we start, I do want to acknowledge that all of us here are joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. I acknowledge their traditional owners, elders past and present, any First Nations people with us in the room, and all the different lands on which people are joining us from around the place today. I also want to encourage that it's generations of observations that help us know that I think we're just moving from whaling season into ghouling season. It has been the season of wombats out and about and snow on the ground and fungi in the forest. But over the weekend, I noticed lots of leafy greenwoods popping up. I noticed lots of little orchids appearing. So we're now in gooding season, which means it's August, which means it's time for National Science Week. And why would we not celebrate by having someone like Richard come and speak? So really exciting, delighted to have Richard here. Many of you will know Richard. Um, some of you might know, oh, he's that guy who's always in the news, <laughs> including yesterday for some of the Wild Deserts project, which was just wonderful. But he is, of course, he's, he's many things. He's many things in addition to the guy that's always on the news talking about birds and things. He's a river ecologist, a conservation biologist. He worked in, you know, environment department in New South Wales for close to 20 years. He's worked right across the Murray-Darling Basin and the Lake Eyre Basin. Um, he's always been a wise, um, really important voice of advice, recommendations, knowledge to much of the decision making around both those basins for um, for Australia. He's had enormous influence. Um, I, but you're not here to listen to me. Richard's here to give us a seminar and to join a national Ramsar workshop for the next couple of days. So it's fantastic to have him here and have the opportunity to listen to him in our seminar today. So thanks to Richard and to Tracy for organising. Um, over to you, Richard. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fran. <laughs> uh, and thank you, everybody. It's so nice to see so many people here and lots of old, older faces who I've um, worked with in the past. Certainly a much better turn up than my Friday vertebrates lecture where yeah. out of my 60 students, four of them decided to come face to face, our uh, first time for face to face lectures. And also <clears throat> thank you to those of you joining online. Right, so <clears throat> I guess this is a sort of big picture area. There'll be a bit of science, but it's I guess sort of an area I've been working in now for a little while, just thinking about the role of science in in terms of systems just having a wee problem here in terms of getting this moving thank you has it got a sure this is on the presentation maybe it looks oh, yes yeah, that's just it like cooking great okay uh i guess you know a bit of a bit of obvious stuff for all of you in this room um we've got this real challenge obviously in terms of biodiversity and declines and particularly for those of us who work in the freshwater world it's even even grimmer in the freshwater world and this is a sort of index from 1970 so if we hadn't got declines then we'd expect to be around that red line vertebrates are probably the best known group and we've had 70 percent decline in diversity of, of vertebrates so it's a big challenge in terms of all of the work that we do here um, I guess the whole ecology of biodiversity, particularly in the Anthropocene, I think to me is the fundamental challenge that we've all got. And I always like to think about, about this through the lens of, you know, what are the major threats that are affecting biodiversity? 
And they're all the obvious ones, pollution, habitat loss, invasive species, climate change, overexploitation, and probably the newest, newest kid on the block, although it's always been there, is disease. And then to me, the thing that I find, and this is sort of a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, is how do we get the knowledge that we're accumulating fast to have some impact in terms of that policy and management response? And this is where I think the context for what I want to talk about today lies. So just a bit of history, because I've been around for a while. Um, in, I started my career in 1980. This, to me, there have been some real positives in this space. Um, and these are biodiversity knowledge, big data. Researcher demographics has changed quite a bit. Uh, I think our university, when I joined it, even in 2005, out of a staff of about 50, there were only two females in our biology department. We've now got almost equity. Um, there's been some negatives, though, and, and, you know, those negatives about biodiversity loss, which has been increasing funding, I think, has generally decreased. Um, there's a lot more controversy in what we do today than there was in the past, and that's understandable given the sorts of things that we're doing and the sorts of impacts we have on business as usual. And, you know, the biodiversity knowledge has just shot up, and this is just a paper out of current biology showing the rapid increase in our knowledge across a whole range of different areas. And those of us who are in the business of generating knowledge um, know this. We know there's a lot of information out there that is not being used. And I think the other thing that's been going on, I, I was prompted to do this for ESA, but I thought about, you know, what happens within governments. And I did a cumulative analysis of name change in the New South Wales Conservation Agency over time. And there's this sort of exponential change in its name. And to me, this reflects some of the real problems government and communities have in biodiversity. They're constantly trying to fix it by changing the name, putting different departments together. I know you guys have been pretty stable for a while, but you know, generally, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> um, but you know, this is symptomatic, I think, of the real challenge in this space. Um, I, I told Andrea that I was going to mention this, but um, I guess the um, Ramsar, the Victorian Auditor General's uh, report about Ramsar, which we're having a meeting about, was also picked on, I think it was, yes, it was in Ramsar in Victoria, but it's it's similar all over Australia and not just Ramsar, it's ecosystem generally. You know, this issue about not having enough evidence for your management, um, who's actually measuring what's changing in our ecosystems and to what extent are they happening and is the data there? And then how do we know things are improving and how are they actually explicitly linked to planning and management? And then what about the whole governance and coordination of what goes on? And I, we have a similar um, report that was out of our audit office in New South Wales about national parks and what they were doing and whether they actually knew whether they were doing a good job or a bad job. So, you know, this is, and again, this won't be any news to you, but um, this really, I think, gives us some momentum to think about how do we scale up the issue? You know, how do we actually deal with conservation at the sort of level that we need to, to deal with the crisis? And what I'm going to talk about initially is about the ecosystem approach and some of the work particularly being led by David Keith um, and how that can be um, supported in terms of species conservation, how some of the international and the national and jurisdictional state momentum is building and will continue to build around the global biodiversity framework um, and how we are being asked more and more as you know, people providing knowledge, how do we know we're doing a good job? What's happening to the taxpayer dollar? And then, of course, we've got some of these big sort of goals like 30 by 30 protected areas, whichever way you define those in by 2030, 30% of the globe by 2030. And, you know, how do we report on whether we've got changes going on, whether they be negative or positive? 
particularly as it's a UN decade of restoration at the moment. So just some basics which you all know, ecosystems, uh, you know, Tansley's um, <clears throat> definition of dynamic complex of plant, animal, microorganism communities and their non-living environments. And it's really some of that interaction that's occurring. I think one of the things that I'm going to talk a lot in the second part of this talk is this idea of social ecological systems, which I think we tend to, as biologists generally, ignore. I've found I've become much more interested in the social science aspects of, of what happens in terms of making change. And then biological diversity, again, many of you will be all over this definition about terrestrial marine freshwater um, and its diversity, not just about species, but obviously ecosystems. So what are these sort of ecosystem attributes? Again, uh, I apologise, this is like a first year lecture, but uh, I think it, it's worthwhile thinking about these. I think, you know, the fundamental challenge we have is we've got this overall focus <laughs> on threatened species and all of us know that's not good enough. So this, there's a need to think about how we deal with common species that are declining and haven't become threatened. And then, of course, there's a whole lot of biodiversity out there, the 99% that we all forget about and certainly no politicians really know about. That's fundamental to the way uh, environments work. And then who knows about processes, let alone just species and ecosystems, and how do we make sure that these things continue to tick? And then, of course, with all the discussion currently about nature positive, both at Commonwealth level and state levels, we've got to think about ecosystem services and an opportunity to sort of put those within that scope. And, you know, the history of um, biodiversity is that there was generally um, comparatively uh, uh, less emphasis on ecosystems, more emphasis on species. Um, sorry, that's cut off a bit. But we, we do know that there are now goals around tracking ecosystem change, ecosystem extent and, and integrity. And this note, in my mind, we've got to sort of think about ecosystems as a whole. We've got to think about how do we monitor them, assess them and then report on them. Um, whoops. Um, and then think about how does that occur and at what sort of policy scales, both at state national and international, and we've got these various um, obligations floating around like Ramsar, CBD, and there are many others that are pushing specifically national governments and, and also state governments to say what's going on in the biodiversity space. And then we've got um, a whole lot of technical tools that are primarily where we operate. Um, I'm going to talk about global ecosystem typology for those of you who are not aware of it, red list of ecosystems, but there's a whole range of things that we routinely do around scenarios and modelling to understand cause and effect relationships. And then I guess the last thing I want to talk about is how does that, then how do we capture some of this in or codify it so that, you know, the science is going straight to the heart of our management. And I'll give you some examples of where we're trying to do that at the moment. So in terms of the biodiversity framework, um, it was agreed at COP last year in December. Um, and the first goal, uh, goal A, is about this, about ecosystems and maintaining them, enhancing them and restoring them. There are a whole lot of targets there, but there's some targets there about Ecosystem. So this is the first time we've really seen a focus at the international scale on ecosystems. And it, it's actually reflecting our knowledge and our need to focus at a larger scale. So, um, so it's not just about maintenance, it's also about restoration in that context. Um, and then, of course, that by 2030, we're going to protect um, at least 30% of land and water in protected areas. Um, which obviously is a major concern. The major concern for our conservation agency and our agencies and our policymakers and our, and our ministers of environment, I don't think industry's quite worked out what's coming down here or how that, what that actually means, but 
I'm sure um, when mining and farming and um, irrigation and some of those industries realise potentially what the implications are of this sort of thing, there's going to be some major further controversies. And then there are these headline indicators. So when we talked to the Commonwealth recently, you know, we ask how, how are you going to measure ecosystems? What's the natural extent? And then how are you going to measure how they're travelling? So the, these two tools are now adopted as standards for, by IUCN. And a lot of that work has been fundamentally underpinned by the leadership in Australia. A lot of it led by David Keith and Emily Nicholson, and also Tracy's been involved in that. But this is really coming to have some major impacts, I think, on, the, on, our, on our business. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of it, um, it was led by David Keith, but a whole lot of us were, were on it. <clears throat> and this is, I guess, a really, I think it's a game changer. Um, it's about thinking of ecosystems, less about which organisms are there, but more about their functionality. We know an estuary is different to a desert, to, to is different to a rainforest. And, you know, how do we get that functionality um, identified and what is the data that we need? And what then is the spatial information required? So, and, and how does that then roll out at state and federal levels? And I think, to me, the analogy when I'm talking to policy, some policymakers and, and politicians in particular, this to me is the jigsaw puzzle of the world. You know, if you think about each of those pieces being an ecosystem, how do we map that jigsaw puzzle of the world? So essentially what we have done is um, in the blue box there, think about the realms, the biomes and the functional groups or ecotypes, but then allowed for jurisdictional, national, biogeographic generally, classifications to essentially vault up. So there's opportunities for us to drive a national classification that would be an international classification by using the data that's available in each of the states. And we're starting to do quite a bit of that at the moment. There are only, you think about, if I've been started at this and thought, you know, how many sort of functional ecotypes are there around the world, including artificial anthropogenic ones, um, I would never have guessed that there are, we came up with 110. So that covers freshwater, marine, terrestrial, subterranean, and also anthropogenic ones. This is, um, I think you may not be able to read that, but that's temperate um, woodlands. This is like the sort of template that we produce, which uh, for an e one of those ecotypes, there's a paper in Nature that came out last year. Um, it had, I think, nine reviewers, and uh, I think it was a fairly short paper in terms of what was published, but the appendices were like 300 pages. And I can't remember exactly how many reviews it went through, but, uh, sorry, um, reviews it went through by about seven, and, and then I think there were about 1,000 pages of review comments. It was the most excruciating process to go through, but um, very useful to to do that. But these ecotypes essentially um, capture uh, components and processes and those drivers of sustainability, but they also have the ability to incorporate different threats and management approaches. And this assembly model, which is sort of, you know, what are the main drivers? Um, what are the main response variables, I think is a really good place to start to build what you need to monitor. What are the things you need to think about in terms of reporting on ecosystem change? So um, as well as that, uh, we built, uh, built this web tool. So if you just go to global ecosystems, you'll find it, but it's a much easier way to navigate through this but it allows you to explore different ecosystems. It allows you some very broad spatial inquiries at national and international scales. It, it sort of says, where are these particular ecosystems? 
Um, obviously, for those of you who have been working in this space, we don't have a map of ecosystems uh, across um, Australia. I mean, we're still working with the interim fire regional assessment, which has been interim, I think, for 20 odd years, doesn't include things like wetlands. So there's some real opportunity, I think, in this space to, to change the way we do these things. There's a whole range of different applications that are relevant here um, in terms of things like reporting on global goals and targets in terms of biodiversity, environmental education, natural um, capital accounting, which is obviously becoming more of a thing and more people are interested in that, comparing different ecosystems, ecosystem risk assessment, particularly in terms of the red listing of ecosystem. Key biodiversity areas, we have outstanding biodiversity areas in our New South Wales legislation, conservation legislation, conservation planning, ecosystem monitoring and management, which is what I'm going to talk about in the second part of this. But there's a whole lot of other things like if we get to the 30 by 30, governments are going to have to use other mechanisms to reward people to manage their land. So we're going to have a whole lot of private land. So how do you decide where that money goes, the stewardship type payments? And this, I think, can help in terms of representativeness. You know, the, 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 um, the values of ecosystem services, nature positive things and the rhetoric that's coming out at the moment, that stewardship, but it also allows you to start to think about, and, and many of you who've sort of been trying to read the tea leaves about where the EPBC Act will go, it's a lot about regional planning and where are the green areas and the red areas and the orange areas. You know, all of those uh, potentially can be looked at much more rigorously through this process, whether you like them or not. And of course, um, there is this, as well as red list of species, there's red list of ecosystems. Many countries of the world have done quite a bit of this. We've done very little in Australia. In fact, one of the ironies are, is that in a research way, we've been leading the world in this space, but in terms of implementation and application, we're back in the pack. And um, there's some real opportunities to lift our game in terms of the application of this, um, particularly given that Australia signed up to the CBD and you know, we've got some obligations now which are going to drive the national government to go down this space. And then of course, you know, I think what's really interesting for someone like me and, and, and probably a lot of you have been working in this space is what can you learn in terms of managing ecosystems? Where do you find out where the key drivers are? What are the things we should be measuring? What are the indicators that help us understand systems? So, you know, this idea of having ecotypes that you can pick from and identify, well, in an estuary, and, and I know this will be pretty obvious for all of us here, is you know what are the key indicators? They might be different for different est estuaries, but the ones most likely to be responsive and to what might be happening. And here's some examples across lakes, temperate forests, um, essentially down the bottom here, thinking about you know the different types of um, ecosystem types across the world and in Australia that you might use this way of this lens to understand how you are going to measure and track ecosystem changes. Okay, so um, that's a sort of big picture, I think, policy framework. I'm now going to sort of jump into the space of adaptive management. And I guess, you know, the, this sort of, we often keep these apart, the human bit and the environment bit. Um, but increasingly I've sort of understood just how important it is to understand what's happening in that human dimension <clears throat> and, and how that can in so many ways affect what's happening in those ecosystems. So you can be managing a whole ecosystem, but if, if you don't understand what the drivers might be, then you've got little way of sort of predicting what's going to happen. So, for example, I've been doing some work in the Lake Eyre Basin recently and um, for quite a while, and we've been managing the threat of irrigation, particularly cotton coming in there and managing that pretty well. So governments have been signed up to that, but largely ignored oil and gas. And we published a paper last year about the effect of the oil and gas industry. And it's just gone into an 
exponential drive in terms of developing things on floodplains, which are largely to do with what's happening in gas and unconventional gas. And so, you know, if you took your eye off that ball, then there's going to be a whole lot of things in the human dimension with major impacts in the ecosystems. And of course, you've got all these feedbacks going on and, you know, trying to find where you land in terms of different systems, and it's going to vary across different parts of states and territories in terms of whether you're going to favour the environment in one space more than another. And this whole idea that's coming out with Commonwealth about red areas where development can go ahead, green areas that are protected, et cetera, sort of, they're going to be, um, they're going to be some ecosystems or areas that are going to be developed and some that will be more protected than others. And when I think about conservation of ecosystems around the world um, and what we're trying to do at the sort of level of ecosystems, if you think of this sort of island effect where we've got natural places, but we've got a, a whole lot of um, human developed places in between, and all of those key threatening processes impacting on these areas. So yes, national parks are fantastic, but they don't necessarily do that much about climate change or invasive species or pollution or disease. So they, they can deal with habitat loss, but it's usually habitat loss to do with land clearing or livestock there. It doesn't actually deal with issues around river management. You can have a, as many of you will know, you can have a, a national park that's a wetland, but if you don't deal or understand what happens to its flow regime, which are outside the boundaries, you're in trouble. So if we mitigate those, that's a really important um, strategy is to mitigate those threats on our natural systems. Obviously, our protected areas, it's another mechanism by which we can think about conservation. And then more and more, which is exciting, is that we're doing restoration. And fundamentally, I think all of these can sit within this adaptive management space. Um, so, you know, that the, the idea that um, this, you know, that I still have that first year lecture where I put this figure up about, I learned about how, you know, succession goes from when you clear something until you've got a, a, a big mature forest. This idea of orderly succession and, um, you know, balance of nature that's sort of, I mean, part of it's there, but really we increasingly talk about disturbance regimes and, and how do they affect our ecosystems? And this sometimes immeasurable complexity and non-linearity, feedback loops, all of these things that are very difficult to understand in this sort of complex environmental world. Um, and, and how do we as sort of mere managers or conservationists think about how do we do our best job to protect what we're supposed to be doing? And really, adaptive management is a whole way of thinking to me about managing that complexity. It's not, I would argue, it's not the Carl Walters view of adaptive management in, in terms of a, a purely experimental approach. It's much more to do with adaptive governance, adaptive planning, and some of those mechanisms, which if you don't get right, you can't actually, I don't think your, your science isn't as effective. And really, um, when you think about it, in a very simplistic way, what we want to be able to do is think we've got some measure of ecological condition over time, and we know that um, we're going to do some, hopefully do some management in that system. We know, particularly in Australia, we've got these highly stochastic indicators that are going to give us trouble in terms of interpreting what's actually going on. And then we're trying to think about, well, if we do some management, are we actually making a difference? So. It, it's really the space in between that's sort of challenging. And, and, and part of that is also being able to admit, and this is a big problem for managers that we fail sometimes. You need to be able to say you don't know everything and you're not always going to get it right. And, and, but that demands you putting it down what you're attempting to do. And so I've been working with the South Africans for a while, thinking about, you know, what this is about strategic adaptive management in Kruger National Park and the idea of, you know, keeping your ecosystem in 
some sort of desirable state where it's bouncing around and then you identify an undesirable zone where you don't want it to go. Some That notion of flipping it into an, uh, a different state. And a lot of this sort of thinking has come from the business um, literature and there's a paper by Snowden in 2002 about, you know, what are the different management um, ways of thinking? You can have something that's very simple where you can identify cause and effect and, and it's pretty obvious. You can, um, you can categorise it and respond to it. You can have complex, ecosystem, complex th things like ecosystems where there's a lot of, um, you know, cause and effect is there, but it's hard to find. Sometimes you have to go backwards, hindcast to work out what the hell's going on. Um, but you can probe and measure and, and understand what's going on. And then you've got complicated systems like a circuit board where there's quite clearly a process of cause and effect uh, which you can work out. And and maybe there are also some chaotic systems that are just too difficult to learn what's going on. I suspect these chaotic ones are just because at this stage we have zero knowledge about what's actually going. We don't know what the drivers might be. Um, and you just re really have to s respond. You can't do anything else. <laughs> the other notion that I really like is this idea of requisite simplicity, which to some extent I think lines up with a whole ecosystem approach um, and Holling captured this in um, 2001. There's a requisite level of simplicity behind the complexity that if identified can lead to an understanding that is rigorously developed but can be communicated lucidly. And it's this notion um, that you can get some functional utility of understanding. To, to begin with, you sort of get an idea and you develop that idea and then you keep wanting to learn more about that idea and it becomes overly complicated, becomes difficult to manage. And a lot of the time I think what that's what happens with some of our science. We keep adding more and more things that we should measure and we sort of get go far apart from the managers and we lose them. But there's the idea that at some point you can simplify this, that you can start to say, well, what are the things that really matter here, which, which are telling us most of the story of what's going on? And, and push yourself down to a, a point where you can actually get some more detail and get more functional utility over time. So that um, this notion that, you know, we don't just need to learn more about something. There's, we need to learn more about the things that tell us how this system works. So, I mean, a lot of this, um, generally in a lot of management of natural resource management, there's a real command and control approach. In other words, you've got a boss that tells you what should be done. They tend to be, they know everything, of course, all the bosses know everything. Um, they're, the idea that they're predictable. Um, sometimes people have said, well, we can optimise what goes on. Um, but this notion of, strategic adaptive management is about, you know, how do we respond to this incredible complexity and how do we tease apart some of those cause and effect relationships? So just very broadly, um, strategic ad adaptive management is about that decision making, acknowledging the complexity that we're dealing with and not just on ecological dimensions, but also social dimensions. But to me, it is about being transparent and rigorous about improving your management. And that also means being rigorous about when you get it wrong and, and being able to admit that. And ensuring that you've got both those social and ecological dimensions in there. And you have ecological monitoring or ecosystem monitoring that's more in integrated with your actual management. And I guess, for those of you um, who've had a fair bit of experience in management of ecosystems or natural resources, um, one of the big challenges is we don't have very good accountability of what people are actually doing there. Um, very little reporting of whether or not their management's affected and, and how it's being reported. So this strategic adaptive management has some steps, like you need to try and work out where you're trying to get to. <laughs> And, and, you know, I never thought that I would be interested in 
crafting visions or thinking about visions, but that's an important part of this step. So you, you know you're here and you want to get to there. If you're restoring an ecosystem, you know where you want to get to. Um, and you need to think about taking everybody along in that process. You know, what, what do the various managers want to do? What are the other stakeholders involved? And of course, your actual trajectory is going to be very different. You know, you're going to actually go all over the place and hopefully get to there. And most of the time you won't get to be, you'll get to some other point. But at least you try to get there and, and you're, you're following some process of active management. And so, you know, that management can focus on a whole range of things that we measure, you know, those the species, the ecosystems, the processes, some of those landscape assets. Um, there's a range of different threats that are going to impact on some things and not others and trying to get some of those clear linkages about where they might be operating. And then, of course, if you're going to do something about it um, and doing nothing is doing something, so that also needs to be clear. You need to be clear about how that's happening and, and you know, how some management actions are going to be related to managing your, your assets, some are going to be related to your threats. And then ultimately, you know, are you doing a good job? And we've seen more and more, and in New South Wales, there's a push towards having traffic light approaches to all of this, and I'm sure you're probably getting similar sort of pressure. And there's some real value in doing that, but we've got to ensure that we've got the granularity in, in the, and, and capturing some of the variability around that. And it's really about how does that then feed in and the whole notion of learning by doing. And in my mind, when I talk to managers, it's about, you know, how do we get what you guys want to do? Um, you say what it is you want to do. We can help you identify what to measure and what specific attributes. And, and then we can sort of work on that sort of scenario and modelling. And there's some definitions in this um, area of strategic adaptive management. As I said, Missions and visions, not my big thing, if you'd asked me five or 10 years ago, but very important to sort of put down on paper where you're trying to get to. Um, what's the context? I mean, every ecosystem has some constraints on it. You can't think that you can manage this ecosystem as if it's a blank green canvas. You've got to put that context down in, in terms of informing that vision. And vital attributes are really an important thing. What are the, What is that requisite simplicity that's useful to really focusing, what are the five to 15 social and ecological things that you think are really important in this space? What are the threats and determinants? What are the models that you're gonna use in terms of how you think this thing works? And that means, you know, you might have a model of what you think as an ecologist works, but does the indigenous owner who manages this, is that the way they think it works? And how do you bring different um, systems of understanding to come to effect. And then this key thing of, of objectives. Now, don't get caught up too much on the language. I mean, those of you who've been involved, you know there's targets and the goals and their objectives and they all get mixed up together and it can be a mess if you're trying to navigate through this. Objectives are just a simple way of getting a finer and finer level of granularity on what you're actually doing. I think, I've been thinking about this a lot because I, you know, again, this is fairly newish area in my career, but as an ecologist sort of thinking about a question and thinking about hypotheses and thinking, okay, I've got a broad aim, and then and then what are my specific objectives or my specific, specific hypotheses that I'm actually going to test and collect data on? The analogy to this is, you know, you've got a broad vision of what you want to do, but what are the things you're actually going to do? No, not that. And if you look at a lot of... Um, you know, I'll talk about New South Wales because um, a lot of New South Wales management plans in national parks, they've got very broad stuff, broad goals at the top, but not a lot of detail about what they're actually doing. So it's about having that transparency. And then, of course, your indicators. Strategic about thinking about the future um, and adaptive, you're learning about how you're doing this and participatory in that you're actually taking everybody along in the journey. And this is, there are a couple of papers there um, that I've been publishing this stuff in, but um, there's that 
first process of about setting the desired state, how do you do that? Um, what's that context that sort of determines what you can and can't do in this space? If it's a Ramsar site, you've got some obligations. You need to think about that, for example. If there's a dam up in the top of a river system, you can't have a free-flowing river. Um, and then what are your management options in terms of what you can and can't do? Some things you can't, you just can't do. Um, as a manager in, for a particular landscape, you need to be explicit about what you can and can't do. How do you actually make it happen? And then, of course, you know, the evaluation and learning. All of these you'll see in most sort of natural resource management stuff. But I think the frustrating thing is it's hard to go beyond the jargon and the rhetoric to see what's, what can you actually do in this space. So, um, and, and you, now I've got a sort of formula where we start with broad stakeholders. We think about we're going to... Uh, um, develop an adaptive management plan for a place. Um, we've got some principles and those attributes and high level objectives. So you have this sort of inverted tree where you've got a vision, some very broad objectives, increasingly fine scale objectives that actually get down to what it is you're going to be doing. What is the sub objective under a program that you'll be doing? Um, you know, what are the actions? Who's responsible? It's, it's essentially good business planning, and I don't think we've done that very well in the conservation space. And we need to do more of that if we're going to deal with this issue of um, biodiversity loss at scale. So I'm now going to finish up by just giving you some examples of where we've been working. Um, two freshwater areas, Malcolm Kungi and Gaini Wetlands, are actually doing some work with the New South Wales government on environmental flows and two terrestrial systems. Um, wild deserts, which is, um, as Fern was saying, the, the stuff that was on last night and on the news, and Fowler's Gap, which is UNSW's field station. So Malcumba Kungi is, is um, right up here, a big national park up in, in the corner here. And um, in the Ramsar site is this massive triangular area in the middle of this, this part of the world. So we started off by bringing a whole lot of stakeholders right across the um, catchment together in Adelaide. Um, these were a range of, you know, conservation, government, oil and gas industry, pastoral science, and four groups of traditional owners. And we did your values. What are the, what are the threats um, to in order to derive a vision and that high level, um, that that high level aspect of, uh, you know, the, those broad objectives that should should be for this space. So we're talking about this big triangular space here. As you can see, it's also a, um, a multi-use uh, area. Even though it's a Ramsar site, there's a national park there, but there's also grazing, oil and gas, and lots of. Um, Although First Nations people don't own it, there's a lot of land they advise on. So we did this setting the side state, thinking about the context as, as, as part of that, and eventually came up with this vision, um, Malcumba Pungi Lakes, an internationally recognised, culturally important, natural, free-flowing, connected system supporting vibrant communities. Now, that was not maybe where ecologists would have ended up, but Everybody in that room had ownership. The South Australian government had ownership. And that provided us the foundation for saying, OK, what are the key things? What are the key top end boxes that we've got to think about? Ramsar came out because the South Australian government said, well, we, it's a Ramsar site. Um, cultural heritage, obviously, environmentally sustainable industries. We re had a really interesting discussion around this. So. The Queensland government person said, oh, he couldn't countenance having environmentally sustainable if you had mining there. And he said, I, I want the word environmentally sustainable out of, because there's a mission underneath that that has environmentally sustainable. And uh, we were able to say to the oil and gas industry people at the table, rather than the Queensland government telling you what you should be thinking, what do you guys think? And they said, well, we're trying to be environmentally sustainable. So that went in there. So you have a lot of um, 
people in government trying to second guess what the best thing is. But um, and then natural systems, legislation, policy, and social aspects. Now, I don't think we could have started from scratch and come up with that fairly easily. Um, but at least that provided the next level. I'm not going to take it any further than that. But underneath here is a lot more detail. What are, what's happening in legislation, policy, and management? What's happening in Ramsar? what's happening in cultural heritage. And we're developing each of those series of objectives over time. Doesn't happen quickly. Um, it involves getting people together to, to do it. The service, but there are parts of it that move more quickly than others. And that's part of actually coming back to it and not reinventing the wheel. This is a really interesting one that I'm working on at the moment with, um, so we're talking here, this is a map of New South Wales. I can get my mouse in there. Um, this down here in the bottom south west, this is a Murrumbidgee River comes in, uh, Yanga National Park, and this 80,000 hectares called Gaini Wetlands has been handed back to the Nari Tribal Council. And it's really um, multi purpose. Um, they're trying to restore the area with environmental flows and vegetation management, but they're thinking about renewable energy, they're thinking about bush foods. Um, now I'm thinking about a whole uh, Aboriginal employment, some really exciting stuff. And so we're working with them on the same approach. Um, there's a consortium of other three members, um, TNC, the Murray Wetlands Working Group, and us at Centre for Ecosystem Science. And, and so a bit like this is their vision, um, and it's about people and country. And, and out of that vision has come that sort of top end of, you know, what are the, the key social and ecological dimensions around management of this ecosystem? And they're the, you can see now there's actually a box air environmental water. This has got highly managed environmental flows in the system. It relies on that. A lot needs to be done there. Partnerships are really important. Um, but they're wanting to do some work on biodiversity, cultural resources, obviously, and, and the other various aspects that fall out in this process. The third one is Fowler's Gap. Um, was a sheep station. I don't know if any of you ever went to UNSW. It's, it's north of Broken Hill. You can see here's um, out far western New South Wales. But we made a decision two or three years ago to convert this area to conservation management field research station. And so that demanded us to say, well, what are we doing there? What, what's the management, conservation management that we're doing there? And in the same way, we had a vision, we had various vital attributes that we identified. It was about research here being a, a critical component, management, research, biodiversity, people, education, financial resilience. So you get some idiosyncratic stuff that comes out, which is important because that shows what your focus is going to be on. You can then say, well, this is what we're going to be doing. I'm going to end and just give you the most, probably most developed part of this work. And um, some years ago, I was trying to get this happening in New South Wales and um, uh, in, in the Macquarie Marshes and um, I was having no end of trouble convincing them that we needed to be more rigorous and 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 specific in our management and I said look I'm out of here I can't influence you anymore and one of the one of the people there said probably with you Richard you've never done any management in your life you got no idea you sit in your ivory tower you publish papers you got no idea about what we need to do so I was really excited <laughs> to be leading a program where we're not only doing the science, but we're doing the management. And basically, this has been a fantastic way of applying this in real in a real landscape. And so this part of New South Wales, right up in the top corner, and UNSW with Ecological Horizons in partnership with National Parks, we manage 40,000 hectares of the National Park to reintroduce locally extinct mammals. So that we've got seven species we have to reintroduce um, and we have these two exposures like I guess all scientists we thought one was not really enough of a sample size, two's not either but at least we've got a couple to experiment with. 
And then we've got this really exciting wild training zone where we're actually going to put animals out there and hopefully keep foxes and cats in low enough densities that they are able to artificially select, if you like, um, some against uh, prey naivety in, in some of these, these species. So fast track evolution, if you like, so we can make for um, bilby predation on cats. No, that's a bit of a dream. Um, but but um, we've got these, yeah, so we've, we've got these two exclosures where we've excluded all um, feral animals, including um, rabbits, and we're putting these locally extinct mammals in there. There's a paper there about this strategic adaptive management approach. Um, so in essence, we've got this national park here, which has cats, foxes, rabbits, everything. On the other side of the border, we've got dingoes, we've also got cattle, and then obviously the pastoral zone. But these two exclosures essentially can only have these seven locally extinct species in there. But the idea is this wild training zone will have a few cats, foxes, and rabbits, and that over time we can actually give, we'll get good enough to control the cats. The cats are our big problem, that we're able to still keep and sustain populations of locally extinct species or threatened species. And that's largely because this fence is the dingo fence. These fences we built here are really great fences, you know, they can't get through, but the dingo fences are leaky. So we need to be able to manage incursions from cats and foxes. Anyway, that's a picture. So again, we spent quite a lot of time thinking about what are we doing here? You know, we've got a contract to put in seven locally extinct mammals, but actually we're doing a lot more. We're trying to restore this ecosystem. And but we need to say we're doing that with ecosystem manipulations, reintroductions and collaborative partnerships. So that was, it took us a while as a team to come up with that. But then, you know, what are those boxes? What are the major boxes? It's about partnerships, about the ecosystems, it's about the resources, the planning, communication. So you can go to what we're doing there and find out exactly what we're doing across the whole portfolio, our business, if you like. There are a whole lot of things there that we've got in our partnerships, our major partnerships, and what we're doing in that space with more and more specific objectives around each one of those that we review and operationalize. And here's a sort of much more detailed where we've got introduced mammal species up here. So feral cat management, so there'll be another one, foxes. We're managing them in the wild training zone and what, what are we doing there? We are trying to reduce cat densities to a certain, um, and we're gonna track their movements. There's a whole lot of science that comes around those specific objectives and requirements for our management. And then obviously in the exclosures, and then we also need to manage overabundant kangaroos. So, you know, how do we do that? And we have one-way gates and we have troughs and we have issues about what do we do when we've got too many kangaroos in this park because there's no standing order. So there are um, uh, uh, issues about animal welfare. And then, of course, our locally extinct mammals, the bilbies, you know, what are we doing with the bilbies in the exclosures? What are we doing with the bilbies in the reintroduction zone? Um, and, and how do we get them in there? How do we make sure that we're testing their improved or decreased prey naivety in terms of cats by, by measuring them against controls in the exclosures? <laughs> So it takes you down a path, I think, that's not that different to what we would do in science by getting quite specific things that you're starting to measure. And then finally, we capture this, we capture this in this spreadsheet, which you know has what is the granularity of the objective, what's the actual focus, what are the indicators that you're measuring, what are you actually doing in management, who's accountable. Um, what are your outputs? Are you, what, what are you going to produce in terms of reports? But what are your outcomes? Are you actually improving something? And that's always been a big issue in terms of eco ecological ecosystem restoration is are we actually delivering out outcomes? Timelines, what's the status of things? Have you achieved it? You know, what's a relevant management strategy and what comments um, do you have on that particular thing? So just to summarise, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really, you know, this whole ecosystem approach and, and managing social ecological ecosystems is really exciting, challenging, but it takes things to scale. Um, I think this approach can be used across a whole lot of our core business, not just managing landscapes, but managing particular threats, um, uh, threatened species. Um, it, we're using it in environmental flow management at the moment. Uh, you need to think about what it is that you're focusing on, just in the same way as when you do a scientific study, you say, well, what's a core question? How do we break that into things that are manageable in terms of collecting data? And I think we need to do more of this because there's more and more focus on, on our business and are we doing it professionally and are we delivering what governments want us to deliver? I think it, that whole idea of ecosystems and the requisite simplicity and thinking about what are the key indicators that are useful here to measure. Um, not all indicators, as we know, will be useful. Some may not be responsive to the threat that you're trying to manage. And then I think one of the things that I find is that we need more transparency around management. And that's not just for the public. Um, what we find is that a lot of managers know a lot and they know everything to do with their place, but they've never really written it down. So there's, it's very difficult to bring people on board very quickly. And that's part of what you know this aims to do. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I love that you bring together a whole lot of ideas and approaches that we apply in all sorts of other ways in a really deliberate and pragmatic way that is going to make a difference. And I also love that you talk about places like Pumbi because I spent a lot of time there years ago and it was great to revisit that. Um, I encourage people online to type questions in the chat. And I'm going to come to the brief in a sec. Um, so far, we've just had Doug um, sending Sorry, a link to us of the open standards for the practice of conservation, which has some similarity. Oh, it has. So I, so I don't know if some of you are aware of open standards, but it has a lot of similarities. In fact, at Gaini, they use open standards. Um, what we find, two things seem to have cropped up with that, one of which is there's not quite the level of detail that sometimes you need or the connection to the vision that's um, clear. And, and the other, I guess, is the, the software morality that's used for open standards. And, and we're finding that our managers sort of get tripped up by that. Whereas we've got a spreadsheet that you can sort of change very easily. Okay, hands in the room. Hi, thanks for the um, speak up nice and loud so people okay. online. Well, in fact, come a little bit forward. And I'll I'll repeat the question oh, for those people online. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you talked about admitting when you are wrong and like when you um, experience failure. How do you come back from that um, in like this day and age where it's like we don't have a lot of money to spare, and if you do it not a great job, then then yeah. how do we trust you going forward? And, yeah. and especially with the relationships with the stakeholders and traditional owners. So yeah, how do you manage that space? Um, so the question was, you know, when you fail, um, how do you manage that in relation to being transparent and and basically then the government's trusting you to do a good job later? I, I guess uh, what I'd probably say is you, you try not to fail on everything, <laughs> hopefully, um, and you have a whole range of things that you're doing. So you would have to get something very wrong to fail big time but you will have some failures along the way. So, you know, I'll just bring it back to, we've just had a failure up at Wild Deserts where we are, uh, last species that we brought in supposedly were stick nest rats. They decided to die on us, like big time. We brought 32 in and 28 or something died in two days. Complete, what we call the catastrophic failure. And, you know, it was grim because, you know, the team was, really wanting to do it, um, but we had to basically go back and say, well, what have we learned? We're not going to hide behind this. We're going to write a paper about it so that it's, it's out there in the open. But we also, I had the minister out there last week and we were able to tell her that, but we've got lots of other places where kicking goals. And so I think I'd probably say you need to show you're being professional, you're actually doing lots of good things and you're failing because you don't know everything. And so that would be the obvious way to respond to that.
saying is always a lesson. Yeah. Let's think for More questions? Uh, Richard mentioned the disease and the bit of a sleeper in uh, some of this uh, ecosystem management. Uh, the things you're interested in, Richard, are these introduced disease from a globalization of the uh, when goes everywhere, or uh, they've been there the whole time and they sort of a stress system, mm. they emerge. In, in general, which of those two is the key? So the question was about disease being a new relatively new threatening process and is it locally um, derived or coming in from outside? Um, Bram, I think if you'd asked me as a conservation biologist probably 10 years ago whether disease was important in conservation, um, you, apart from vets thinking it's important, most conservation biologists would have probably discounted it because there was no obvious signal there in many systems or species but then we saw facial tumor disease which was happened in um, tassie devils and that clearly was something that had been there internally for a while and then got out of hand and then of course you know we've 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 had COVID, and we've and the most recent and most serious probably most serious one for wildlife is is bird flu and what that's happening in the northern hemisphere and how that that's moving. So I think both sources are coming. I think the crux of your question is I think we're seeing more and more of these because of the stresses on the environments and and how much more closely humans are exploiting, using, interacting with those environments and the stresses that that imposes on those wildlife, particularly those ones that can move into where humans are. We're going to get, you know, those Zoonosis happening more and more. It's hard to see why they weren't, wouldn't do so. But it, but I think in terms of conservation of species and ecosystems, because of those stresses, we're seeing disease becoming more and more prominent as a key threatening process. Mm. Thank you. Um, what sort of level of effort do you think is needed to apply the ecosystem typology to Australian ecosystems? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so the question was, uh, how do we apply, what, what's the effort required to apply the global ecosystem typology to Australian ecosystems? I, we've been thinking about that quite a bit. We think that the most appropriate way of doing that would be to, the states have most of the data, and, and mostly it's going to be veg data, but there's a real opportunity to crosswalk the classifications in states to the global ecosystem typology and, and assess the likelihood of those particular um, classifications mapping. A lot of them, I mean, I'll look at it very broadly as a lot of them are gonna map pretty well, but you're gonna obviously have a whole lot that aren't going to work that well. And it's working on those that that's gonna be the challenge, but we're about to, we've got a project at the moment looking at wetlands where we're, we're wanting to crosswalk um, a whole lot of national um, classifications, Brazil, Europe, um, US, South Africa, India, and Australia, to the, and Ramsar, to the global ecosystem typology. And it's going to be a process of expert elicitation where we're going to look at the likelihood of people um, basically putting membership in those particular groups. And I think that's probably the best way to go. And then it's a case of then using those maps to then um, link those into a, an ecosystem map. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it can be done. And we're currently looking at um, doing that with wetlands uh, in, in Queensland and using their classification and into South Australia for a catchment to see how difficult it is to do that. We've got another project we're working with Bush Heritage where we're applying the global ecosystem typology at the at the reserve scale and seeing how that works in terms of you know what are the indicators if you use this. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just lost a question online which was about evaluation. But I just follow up with one of the In terms of the typology, do you consider the airspace? Do you think that the airspace has been yeah. similar to um, you know aquatic water? Yeah. It's just yeah. the medium yeah. is air instead of water. 
I'm only I was expecting uh, that question. So, so, so the question was about the airspace, and why that wasn't really considered. We did consider the airspace, but there was so little known about it. So, if you have to actually have a look at the paper, it talks about the air biosphere, um, and there's very little known about how you would separate that out. So that's a gap, definitely, but an important one that we got to, we should think about. Yeah. Yeah. Last one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. It's really so much to think about. Um, but I was going to ask a question about uh, sort of the ecosystem biology as well. And as, as you mentioned, I guess especially in, in policy, I think people have been thinking in terms of threatened species for a long time. How uh, uh, do you have a, a view of how the threatened species and yeah. the ecosystems are likely to come together in terms of prioritisation and how you would like to see yeah. happen or how yeah. you think it will happen? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was about um, threatened species and how that juxtaposes with um, global ecosystem or ecosystem management. Look, I think that's a really good question. I mean, ultimately, you're not going to ditch koalas, you're not going to ditch regent honeyeaters. Um, you know, those those threatened species are always going to be important in terms of, of, of management. Uh, but I guess the question would be, and, and I don't think you should, and, and threatened ecological communities is also important. So we do need to do a whole lot of work about identifying which of the ecosystems are threatened, but then we need to sort of take a much broader approach and say, okay, let's, let's map all the ecosystems, let's see what their attributes are. Instead of using the interim bioregional assessment process, and that Let's, let's have a new way of thinking. And then within that, we can start to assess ecosystems and how they're doing. Um, and, and, then, and then at the same time, we might find that, you know, temperate woodlands maps really well to koala conservation. And therefore, you just map that in as one of its main indicators. So there, I think there's lots of ways that they can be synergistic. Um, and, and capitalise on more of the broader public's understanding and, and I guess, loyalty to species as opposed to ecosystems and, and understanding that, you know, we need species to be vehicles for talking about ecosystem conservation. Of course, now that we're over time, the questions are starting to fly. <laughs> but I would encourage everybody to just keep this conversation going because it's such an important one, such a useful one, such an optimistic one as well. So please keep talking. If you've got time now, hang about in the team room and keep yep. talking. Um, but otherwise, please uh, join me in thanking Richard and make sure you come to our next seminar as well.